thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I am very uh, happy to well, virtually uh, be at the Bank of Chile and um, tell you about this new project that we've been working on uh, with Daniela Pujoni from Banco de Mexico and Alan Spirot, who's also at UC Santa Cruz. So the title of the paper is Everybody Fights an American War. And what we do in uh, this paper is show the spillover effects of the US-China trade war on markets in Mexico. So we hope before we begin, um, let me start with a disclaimer. Um, in this project, we're going to use several databases that are confidential and that were accessed through Mexico's um, National Institute of Statistics, Geography and, Informa and Informatics, uh, also known as INEGI. However, the views that we're expressing here or the opinions that we say every mistake that we make is our own responsibility and doesn't reflect the views or official statistics or policy stance of Banco de Mexico, its board of directors or INEGI. So all mistakes are wrong. Okay, now that that's out of the way, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how we, um, you know, the motivation that we use for this project and why we're interested in this project. So as many of you know, during the Trump administration, um, the US government embarked in one of the largest um, shifts towards protectionist um, policies since the smooth holly uh, tariffs in the 1930s. So because of this increase in uh, tariffs, the average uh, duties applied to products coming from China increased by approximately 10.3 percentage points or 159%. So there was a huge increase uh, in the cost of um, duties for products um, imported to the US from China. And uh, when we weight those uh, tariffs by the share of imports to the US, um, the average trade weighted import tariff increased by about, um, this is actually, I believe, a typo. This should be 188%, rather than 1.88. Um, and there's already existing literature that shows that these change in tariffs have very significant effects on, um, on the US. So they find that prices rose significantly. Almost the entire increase in tariff was um, borne uh, by US consumers and US firms. So it was like almost complete pass through um, to prices. And then also um, they find that export competitive competitiveness from the US decreased. So a lot of the products that received tariffs were used as inputs by firms um, in the US. And hence, uh, because of the increase in price of those imports, uh, U.S. firms became less competitive abroad. So there seems to have been major negative impact to the U.S. from these tariffs. But what we're trying to answer in this project is how did it affect other trade partners? So how did what we're going to call outsiders? So how did countries and firms that were not directly involved in the trade war, um, where they managed to take advantage of these unexpected export shocks? Right. Um, so, our research question very broadly is, what were the effects of the U.S.-China trade war on firms in Mexico? Um, why Mexico? Well, again, first of all, like we said before, we want to focus on a country that wasn't directly involved in the trade war. And second, Mexico is one of um, the U.S.'s biggest uh, trade partners. So, we think that if there's going to be um, countries that could potentially benefit from the export shock to the U.S., uh, Mexico would be a good candidate to explore this in. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the effect of the U.S. tariffs on Chinese um, exports, and we're going to be looking at a wide uh, range of response margins. And importantly, we're not going to be looking uh, at we're not only going to be looking at the aggregate effect, but we're actually going to like narrow it down and see in a specific firms based on what their export mix um, is or for specific workers based on their industry of occupation or their location, how were they uh, affected by the tariffs? So in that sense, for firms, we're going to look at workers and we're going to look at both the extensive and the intensive margin. And we're going to compare how they respond to the shock, both across products and destinations. We're also just going to look at total employment. So how did firms, so if firms that are exposed to a shock, um, that we were going to classify as a demand shifter in a sense. So do they respond to that increase in demand by hiring more workers, potentially by increasing wages? Alternatively, they could potentially shift production away from the local market and towards the US. So we're going to explore these various uh, margins. 
and also for workers. So this is grayed out because this is something that we haven't done yet, but we hope to do. Um, so for workers, we so I'm going to make, make grandiose claims about all the things that we can potentially do with workers since we haven't done that part yet. Uh, but uh, we we hope to be able to say things about whether formalization rates changed, whether there was reallocation across industries or locations, and again, what were the um, effects on their wages. So that's um, the overall plan. And in order to answer these questions, so there's plenty of market uh, participants that we're going to explore. So we're looking at exporters, non-exporters. We're looking at labor markets as a whole. We're looking at workers. So for each of these market agents, we're going to um, use different sources of variation to analyze the impact of the tariffs um, across various margins. So very broadly, uh, we're going to first try to answer whether there was trade diversion and estimate the magnitude of it. So did firms that export shift their composition away from products that um, were not exposed to the tariffs towards products that were? And in particular, were, was that uh, recomposition directed towards the U.S.? So in order to do that, we're going to look at within exporting firms, so firms that are exporters, we're going to compare um, changes in the growth of exports across their different product mix. Um, then we're going to ask, well, how did exporters outcome change? So given that you export and um, um, have a certain um, composition of exports, how did you adjust uh, the value of exports towards the U.S. So, given that we find, uh, which we do, trade diversion, how did this trade diversion come to be? Did you hire more workers? Did you shift your up output? Did your revenue change? So, we're going to look at across exporting firms uh, within product destination categories, how did these outcomes uh, change? So, these are the two uh, main results that I'm going to show you today. The rest uh, is either work in progress or plans for the future. So the next thing that we plan to do is um, across different establishments, so not firms, but across different establishments that participate in specific markets where we define a market by industry myth, uh, municipalities um, categories, how did aggregate output and uh, labor demand get affected? So our idea here is that even for establishments that do not directly participate in exports, the fact that exporting firms um, received this export shock and hence potentially change their labor demand could also affect other establishments, even those who are not directly involved in, in uh, foreign trade through the labor market, right? To the labor market and then also potentially through changes in the local uh, price index. So we're going to try to analyze uh, that as well, although like I said, that is still um, work in progress. And finally, we're also going to exploit um, we're going to compare across municipalities within Mexico to try to say something about general equilibrium um, effects. And again, this is still very much um, potential work in progress. We would ideally also want to compare across workers um, and across occupations within municipalities. So the idea behind this um, plan going forward is that, again, different regions in the country, different municipalities, differ in terms of their industrial composition and hence were differentially exposed to the shock. So this is um, the within municipality analysis is similar to what the you know author um, et al paper have done. So comparing across the US, different exposure um, of firms within each location. Uh, in our case, we want to do something similar, but instead exploiting uh, across occupation uh, variation within a municipality. So that's um, our, our plan going forward. Although, like I said, today I'm gonna focus on the first two of these um, effects. So I don't know if this is potentially a good point to just stop. I, I know this is very early on, but I can, I'm happy to entertain any questions if there's any, because again, this is the new, um, this is the first time that this project sees the lights of, of day. So I want to make sure that we receive as much feedback as, as we can. Brenda? Mm -hmm. This is Ernesto. Uh, Hi, here. Ernesto. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm from the bank. Uh, so I want to ask you about the big uh, about big picture. Is this mm -hmm. paper about measuring effects in a given economic situation, mm -hmm. or is about using a particular episode to say something about uh, how trade theory 
uh, works and should work, or both maybe, or something else? Um, that's, that, that's a good question. So I would say the former. So this is something about a particular episode, because in this particular episode, the previous literature has found that there is a lot of pass through through prices in the US. Um, so, so I wouldn't want to claim that the magnitude of the effects that we estimate would be, you know, we will be able to extrapolate that to other instances of trade shocks. That being said, um, I think, and I'll mention this uh, briefly after, um, once I discuss the literature review, um, another important aspect of like the big picture as we see for this project is that the literature so far has shown evidence of trade diversion, right? That is something that I think we are all comfortable with saying it's a, maybe even a stylized fact, right? So if uh, two trade partners get hit by, a, um, you know, there's a, a protectionist tariff, then other trade partners might benefit from it. So that's, but what we haven't really explored yet, partly potentially because of data uh, constraints, is how does that, how do those other trade partners manage to, um, you know, increase their um, exports towards the affected countries and what type of consequences do we see for the firms and workers in that third party country? So that's something that we don't, we really have little evidence about. Um, and, and that is in, in that sense, that, that's why I say that this is more like the first kind, right? We're trying to estimate these effects that we do, don't really have good evidence on yet. Um, the extent to which this can be extrapolated to other instances of trade shocks, I think, varies depending on the pass-through. Um, the China-US tariffs, um, the evidence is that there has been a lot of pass-through, and that's an important assumption that we're going to make for um, our model and, you know, uh, some of the, the, the ways that we measure things. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Brenda, I have a just clarifying question. So, today mm -hmm. you're not going to talk about any impact on non tradable sectors like the point three, I think, was about establishments. You're going to focus more on exporting firms. And yeah, that's also, correct. Right? So today I'm going to focus mostly on exporting firms, although I will speak about the extensive margin of exports. So I'm going to talk about whether we observed firms entering the export market or not. Um, spoiler alert, the answer is no. <laughs> so it's only the incumbents <laughs> that, are, that are being affected. Um, but um, if time permits, then I will talk about our strategy for how to um, measure the effect across um, non-exporting and exporting establishments. So I'll, I'll talk about the strategy. I won't have any results to show you yet for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the data. Like I said, one of, the, um, one of our big contributions here is gonna be uh, empirical and is related to the fact that we overcome some of the difficulties with observing some of these things. And in order to do so, we rely on Mexico's INEGI, who has been um, uh, uh, a great uh, source of help. So we're going to be using um, at least two databases from, from INEGI. One, um, which I'm going to call PEME, is a profile of exporting manufacturing firms. So it's a census of all firms in Mexico that export or import um, in manufacturing. We have the data for these firms fr from 2015 to 2019. Um, and as I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you more details about the data later on in the presentation, but essentially we can track all of their exports across all of all countries um, at the eight product digit code. So we're able to see all of uh, Mexico's manufacturing exports and imports. Uh, on top of that, we're also gonna um, combine this data with a survey that's called EMIM. So EMIM is a survey of manufacturing establishments and it's a monthly level survey. We're gonna use the data from 2015 to 2019, although the data, the data is available starting in 2007. So this is a panel of manufacturing establishments, which we can um, link to PEME. And by so doing, we can observe not just the exports of a firm, but also the composition of its establishments across industries, how much they produce, what is the value of productions, of sales, what, is, what are their profits? So we can know a lot about the establishments that are connected to a firm that exports in Mexico. Um, again, once we start thinking about how to analyze the effect on workers, we're thinking about using a household survey called ENOE. That it's a rotating panel that allows us to track workers across time. So the idea there would be to um, derive a measure of the trade shock at uh, either occupation or industry level 
and then apply that shock to the workers and then see how they fare before and after the um, tariffs were applied. So that's kind of the general idea for, for the worker side, although again, this is just a speculation and I can um, make grandiose promises. With the other two, then I actually have to show you some results. So, um, uh, and then finally, well, how are we gonna measure our trade shock? We're gonna measure it with com combining these two data sources but then also taking advantage of um, tariff data from the U.S. So as you know, in the U.S., um, there's information available for tariffs at the HS10 product level. So we're going to aggregate that to the HS6 level to make it compatible with uh, PEME. And then we're going to make various adjustments such that, that our shock isn't just the average tariff for a particular firm, but rather we're going to take into account that um, even if a firm, uh, even if two firms export the same product, you know, the intensity with which they export it might differ, the extent to which they rely on exports for their revenue might also differ. So these different measures of exposure to international market are also gonna matter for um, our trade shock in a way that we derive from a model. So I'll show you uh, as well today. Okay, so our main findings. Linda? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a short question? This is Federico yeah, from the Central Bank. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. So, so on the previous on the previous slide, do you have? I may have missed this. Do you have data on the on the on the EMIM? Uh, does it include data on prices on domestic prices of output or 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 or, or inputs of these firms? Kind of. Um, so in the meme, we have data both on the total employment and, like I said, all of these variables um, on the uh, establishment side. And then it also has a very detailed, very detailed information about production at the product level with one important caveat. I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this um, when I actually get into the data <laughs> description, but okay. the, the short answer is kind of. <laughs> but, but, okay. yeah, but, but ask me again, if when I get to the data slide, you, um, I, I don't answer that question. Okay, and the second, and the second short thing is that, I guess this, these tariffs, I mean, they were the tariffs that the US a put and then the, the responses of China and so on. So I guess this could also affect other trade partners of Mexico, like through global supply chains indirectly, right? That it's sort of not accounted for directly through the exposure that Mexico has with the US or China, right? So it's like other, like third trade partners that are both trade partners with Mexico and China or Mexico and the US. Um, um, and sort of, would you would you take that into account and control for that when you're looking at this exposure to the event? So I would say um, two things. We do observe Mexico's um, imports and exports across all uh, 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 across all countries, not just across the U.S. Yeah. Right now, we're using a specification where we measure exposure. Uh, to a particular product based on your uh, share of exports in that product to the U.S. over total U.S. exports. Alternatively, we could, and I think this is maybe where you're heading, we could instead say, like, well, your, your exposure to a given product is not just how much you export of it to the U.S., but how much you export it um, anywhere. So we could potentially make an adjustment to reflect that. That being said, uh, as I showed, so our measure is going to be derived or measure of the shock is going to be derived from a model where assuming that um, the direct effects of U.S. tariffs on China is the only thing that's going on and, you know, forgetting about some more general equilibrium effects uh, on trade, then this, this would be the shock. This would be a very approximate value for the shock that we will get. Um, that, that is an assumption okay. that we're making, but pot potentially we might be able to relax that um, uh, and then, so that, that's one thing that the, the shock is going to be derived from a model. And the second thing is that another important assumption is the level of pass through to the US, which seems to be pretty high uh, for, from prior literature. So we're, we're comfortable with the, the effect of the, the, the change in the price index that's um, generated by the tariff is equal to the tariff. So, okay. Um, okay, so uh, what do we find so far? The first thing that we find is that if we compare uh, growth between 2017 and 2019 at the firm level, firm level export growth um, to the U.S. increased significantly, in, specifically in the products that were affected by the U.S. Uh, to China tariffs, 
and this is after controlling for both firm, um, firm and product growth trends. So if we use uh, a simplified measure of the shock, uh, which doesn't take into account this type of um, exposure measures as we were discussing uh, with Federico, we find an effect of 0.4%, so an elasticity of 0.4%. Uh, with the model-based shock, we find an increase of 1.2%. And remember, this is at the firm level. So this is, this is a really large, um, this is a really large shock. And um, uh, in a double difference specification, so comparing the growth rate between 2017 and 2019, to the growth rate between 2015 and 2017, we again find an, uh, an increase um, in the difference in firms' export growth. So then it's a double difference um, a specification uh, of 1% using the, let's call it simplified tariff shock, and 3.2% with a model based shock. So again, the, the magnitude that we find for trade diversion are, are very large given the standard um, in the literature. And we also find some preliminary evidence that we interpret as being consistent with these effects being driven by the intensive margin rather than by new firms entering um, the market. And in particular, we find that actually the tariff shocks, the mean tariff shock is associated with a 4.7 percentage point decrease in the probability of new entry to the US market. Um, so what we mean by this is we don't mean uh, necessarily just new exporters, we mean starting to export a product to the US. So you could have been exporting other things before, but do you start exporting the type of products that were affected by the average um, tariff shock to the US? And the answer is that declines um, with, with the tariff shock. The way that we interpret this is that, you know, that the, the tariffs, as others have documented before, also increase just policy, trade policy uncertainty. So the probability that a firm decides to enter a product market that it hadn't been participating in before uh, declines, um, potentially because of this uncertainty. Okay, now in terms of what happens to exporters' labor demand and output, we find large elasticities of um, firms' exposure to the trade shock, um, sorry, uh, of labor demand and output with respect to firms' exposure to the trade shock. Uh, so a 1% increase in exposure is associated with a 0.31% uh, increase in employment when measured with the weighted average tariff and a 1.15 when using the model-based shock. We also find an increase uh, in total wage payments. And importantly, we can actually disaggregate this effect across um, contract types. And what we find is that the, this effect is entirely concentrated on blue collar directly hired workers. So when we look at white collar workers or outsourced workers, we find no effect. And this is true despite the fact that um, exporters are more likely to use outsourced labor than non-exporters. Okay, so all of this effect seems to be concentrated among directly hired blue collar workers. Importantly, the elasticity of the value of production and the value of sales is also positive and statistically significant, 0.59% and 0.67% respectively. And we do not find statistically significant effects for the value of production outside the establishment's main industry. I'll talk more about what that means um, when I describe the data, although this is related to Federico's question about whether we can see prices and whether we can see different um, production within an establishment. And then also importantly, the total revenue from the national market also doesn't have um, a significant change. So, uh, this, this evidence is um, somewhat preliminary, but, but we can interpret this uh, lack of effect on total revenue from the national market as there not being reallocation of production away from national markets and towards international ones. So we don't find an effect um, directly on national markets. Brenda? Yeah? Uh, I just, I'm, I'm not sure, but do you have data on, on what happened with non price-based um, trade barriers, like, was there like an increase in tariffs, but also an increase in, you know, all these um, administrative procedures, permits, all those things that are hard to see, because uh, I, kept, mm -hmm. I kept thinking about what you said, that firms wouldn't want to enter into a new market because of the uncertainty, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. perhaps there is an increase in the fixed cost of entering just because you have, I don't know, like uh, some stamp or something. Um, yeah. Um... My understanding is that 
there so if there was an increase in the cost of entry it probably came from the rise in uncertainty in a way um i i don't have i mean i guess we could find some other source of data to get a sense of like how costly is it to you know process a new exporters you know red tape or whatever uh so we, we don't have data that directly speaks to that that being said, so one of the things, one of the reasons why we wanted to split up the uh, effect on employment between white collar and blue collar workers is because I remember seeing other papers that show that when policy uncertainty, broadly speaking, goes up, firms tend to hire more white collar workers, partly in order to help them navigate to this uh, additional rate tip. And we don't find that. So that might be a, an effect similar to, to maybe what you have in mind, which is um, the probability of entering the export market has gone down, maybe because of additional costs, maybe because of um, the uncertainty. And through that declining probability, then uh, we also don't observe an effect on these white collar workers. So that's potentially what um, that is maybe one of the reasons why we don't find an effect in white collar workers, since the extensive margin of exports it seems to be driving our, our results. Maybe. Next one. Okay, so how do we relate to the previous literature? I don't, um, I don't want to offend the sensitivities of any trade economists, um, <laughs> but uh, the way that I, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna preface my description of the literature by saying that I am not a trade economist. So if this is overly simplified, I apologize in advance. But so my understanding of the literature so far is as follows. Um, there's plenty of papers about trade diversion. Like I said, we, I think we, um, we can all agree that trade diversion is, is a thing and several people have documented it for many different um, pairs of countries, groups of countries, multilateral trade agreements, also you know, negative shocks to trade. Um, and then a more recent literature has tried to analyze well, what are the effects of those trade policies, not just over whether um, exports from other countries change, but specifically on firms and workers. Um, however, this literature that focuses on firms and workers um, has been um, exploring the effect on one of the countries um, or, or, or sometimes even both of the countries that are directly involved in that um, trade policy. Um, meanwhile, so for example, the Goldberg um, et al paper, the Goldberg et al uh, papers are looking at the effect on um, India's trade liberalization um, on Indian firms, right? Um, the author and Dorn Hanser paper look at the US uh, when China entered the, the World Trade Organization. So again, um, you know, the Devlin, Kovac and Morrow paper look at the effect of um, the uh, NAFTA entry for Canadian workers. So again, in each case, the focus is uh, workers or firms in a country that was directly affected by, um, by the change in trade policy. And instead, in our case, what we want to do is, well, what happens to firms and workers by these non-directly involved um, countries? Um, so another literature that we relate to, of course, is um, the, the very growing and um, current literature about the US-China trade war specifically. Uh, that again, first off, there's been several papers documenting that the tariff had a very, um, high impact on prices in the US. Um, the Amiti, Reading, and Lansdown paper find that the effect is almost one-to-one, -one, right? There's almost complete pass-through. Uh, and the effects are not just short-term. Like even in the long term, if you look at the change in prices for products that were affected by the US-China tariff, um, the, the price is almost one-to-one -one equal to the tariff. So pass-through has been very high. There's only a couple of papers that we know of that look at these spillovers on outsiders. One is from actually a PhD student here at UCSC, Sanyal, who looks at the effect of the US-China trade war on um, India, on Indian firms. And uh, there's the Becker and Schroeder paper that uh, computes uh, general equilibrium analysis um, with global value chains. So in our work, uh, again, we, as far as we know, we're among the first, or uh, if not the first, to look at both firm and labor market adjustments with uh, a significant granularity in outcomes and analyzing, analyzing different response margins for these 
outsiders to the trade war. Okay, so we want to know whether Mexico is also fighting the trade war um, indirectly. All right, so the outline for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna give you a little bit of just background about the US-China trade war, show you some um, uh, basic uh, facts about it. And I wanna give you more detail about our data. I'm gonna walk you through the main aspects of our model, which is gonna help us derive a uh, shock um, to firms in Mexico from the US-China trade war. And then I'm gonna discuss how we're gonna implement that shock empirically. Then we're gonna walk through the findings and then I'll conclude. And if I have time, I'll talk about these next steps of how we're thinking about the shock for non-exporters. All right, so as you know, China is a major trade partner um, to the US and um, a flashpoint in the political and economy of both tariff and other policies. In 2018, uh, the U.S. implemented several tariffs. There were various points in time where the, there were at least four um, waves of tariffs. We're not exploring, at least not, not right now, the exact timing of each of the uh, waves. But rather what we're going to do is we know that by uh, 2019, all of the tariffs were in place. So we're going to mainly focus on comparing 2019 to prior years. And in some specifications, the first quarter of 2019, to other uh, to first quarters in other calendar years. So, but during 2018, the US uh, increased its tariffs and China also retaliated, although those retaliations were mostly in agricultural products. So the tariff shocks ranged between 10, 15, and 25%. The unweighted average tariff across products was 8%. But once we weighed uh, those tariffs by how much the US exports, uh, sorry, imports from China, those um, those values were drastically higher. So let's um, let's take a look at some of these effects. So here we have just the average value of tariffs. On unweighted uh, black line shows all imports for the US, red line shows imports from China, and then in green we have imports from Mexico. So as you can see, before 2018, the average unweighted tariff um, of products imported by the US from China was around 7%. And then it increases almost 10 percentage points, or a little bit over 10 percentage points after 2018. So there's this huge increase in the average tariff um, between the US and China. There's also a small, uh, there's a spike, actually, I'm sorry to call it, there's a small spike, relatively small spike in um, tariff from Mexico, which were mostly directed to steel, aluminum, and solar, which disappeared by the end of 2019. That's average tariff. Now, most of those tariffs were concentrated in products that initially have low tariff value. So again, here we have in red, these are the products that were affected by the US um, China shock. And as you can see, you know, they, in, the, the level was a lot lower in the pre-period, but during the, the trade war, these were the products that were uh, mainly affected. So they targeted products that, that had initially lower tariffs is the main takeaway from this, um, this graph. Um, and then importantly, so here we have within, so these are the imports uh, from China specifically, and the average tariff that they experienced. So um, within um, the Chinese products, the, sa the same is true, right? So you look at the average tariff of products imported um, from China by the US, the tariff for those products that were affected by the uh, trade war was ex ante a lot lower um, than for the rest of the products that were not directly impacted by the trade war, okay? As a result, imports from the US fell, or we argue as a result, imports from the US fell, especially from China, All right? So here we have the baseline, um, this is the log of exports uh, with two year 2000 as a baseline. So we see relatively similar trends uh, between ex uh, imports from Mexico and China. Um, but we find this big, relatively large drop in um, imports from uh, China after the, the tariffs were imposed. In Mexico, meanwhile, doesn't have a decline, actually it has a, a slight increase. And then when we split this um, changes between those products that were affected by the tariff shock and those that were not, 
uh, as you might expect, the products that were not subject to the to the uh, tariffs from the US-China trade war, this is the line in green, seems to be uh, mostly plant. Meanwhile, the products that were affected in red experienced this large decline. Um, imports from Mexico somewhat um, rose, although not as, uh, as much as we uh, would expect. However, again, this is just aggregate um, imports. So there might be some composition effects there, and that is one of the reasons why we want to explore at the firm level what happens to firm level export growth. So this graph is just showing again with baseline year 2000, what is the, um, uh, the change in the log um, of imports from Mexico to the US. Uh, in red are the products that were subject to the US-China uh, tariffs, and in green are the products that were not subject to the US-China um, tariffs. Okay, so already before the, um, even before the tariffs, the products that were hit by um, tariffs have higher growth in exports uh, from Mexico. Um, okay. All right, so now let's talk about, uh, I do have any questions uh, about. Yes, this? I have one very quick. Uh, uh -huh. Brenda, this is Ernesto again. Uh, okay. Do you have a similar picture for this extensive margin we were talking before? Uh, so we don't have a picture, but we can make one. That's a good, that's a, a good point. I do have just like a count of number of firms exporting to product destinations. And I can tell you that's pretty flat. That being said, that uh, table has some restrictions um, about the, num the numbers that we can show you. So we cannot really show cells that have fewer than two, three observations. So there's some caveats there, but um, um, I, I'll show you a table in a few slides, but essentially the number of firms participating in um, different, the average number of firms participating in each product market, where a product market is defined by an HS6 code and a destination, remain fairly stable throughout um, at around 27 firms, if I remember correctly. Because a natural concern is mm -hmm. whether uh, we should interpret a tariff change as a tariff shock. And therefore, there may be some anticipation going on, uh, and it's and I, I'm not exactly sure how to to think about uh, those figures. But at the time where there is this vertical line, there is, seems to be a small increase when we see a decrease later on. So I don't know whether that is the that means the impact reaction to the uh, change of the tariff. Or is just by accounting something that happened right before the change in the uh, tariffs. So you're saying we example. see we see this uptick and then we see uh, right. a decline. So um, that 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 little spike up, I'm not sure what it is. We can consider something that happened right after the tariff change was implemented, mm -hmm. or is something that happened before and because of the way that the graph is constructed seems to happen uh, at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, this, this graph is because it uses just, just aggregate data. It is focusing on just year, year and year relative to 2000. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll say two things. Yes, we can look at whether the number of firms that are entering is varying on very aggregate level, just like counting the number of firms participating. The answer seems to be no. Whether so that's one part of the answer. Uh, whether there are anticipatory effects, um, the only thing that I would say for now is a we will look more into it, and b one of our uh, in our main specifications what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the change between 2019 and 2017 to the change between 2017 and 2015. So that that would um, eliminate 2018 altogether and and get rid of that, and and that's where. So the findings that I have cited so far refer to those comparisons. And again, they're all at the firm level. So there's like firm fixed effects and you know, product destination time fixed effects and, and, and whatnot. So we're controlling for any sort of trends in that in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think that is super useful for all that is intensive margin, but for the extensive margin, you can still be mm -hmm. counting at some effect, something that is really anticipation. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. look more into the, the, that possibility and um, yeah, there might be, 
we'll look more into that possibility. But for now, I'll just say that like that the number of firms doesn't seem, seem to change. But yeah. Okay. So let's talk about um, our data in more detail, and then um, Federico, you can tell me whether this answers your your question. So our first um, our, our main data comes from this uh, database called PEME. So PEME, as I said, is a census. We have all exporting firms from 2015 to 2019, and we have records of their annual value of exports and imports for each firm product destination pair. Um, we're gonna aggregate the destinations into four categories, US, China, Canada, and others. Um, and then besides that, for firms during the years when they're exporting, we have information on their total employment and the total value of production. Uh, those values are calculated by INEGI using a combination of census and survey data. Now, the downside of this is that for years when the firm doesn't export, we cannot observe um, its data on employment or value of production. So what we do is we start with PEME and we construct a balanced firm product destination panel. So what we mean by that is that if a firm exports a product at any point in time, to any destination, then we create a balanced panel from that. So we will have, you know, a, a bunch of zeros if the firm just didn't happen to export that product to the US, but did export it to China or vice versa. Right? So that's what we mean by saying we construct this firm product destination panel, partly to allow for firms um, to have the potential of entering um, a market at any point in time. Um, Okay, so that's, um, we also, you know, we, we test whether that, um, that restriction or that, that assumption that we make about entry uh, matters for our results. And the answer is no, uh, it matters for the magnitude, but not for the, um, for the economic um, impact. Okay, so this, this is our, our main data set. And already you can see, well, the, the main problem there is that you cannot see um, a firm unless it is exporting. So we complement this with MEM. So MEM, as I was saying before, is a manufacturing survey at the establishment level where we can see the establishments um, month to month. Uh, it's a panel, they ha it has approximately 10,500 establishments uh, per month. Uh, they started in 2007 and has uh, information up, up to 2020, although again, we're not using the 2020 uh, data, we're stopping in 2019. And we're comparing the first quarter of 2019 to first quarters in other in other years. So the advantage of MIM is that it has very detailed monthly information for establishment. So we know the workers, the number of hours, the contract type that the workers have. We know the total revenue, both international and national. We know things about the costs uh, for the firm. And then at the annual level, we also have information about investment that we haven't really uh, used yet, but we could potentially uh, observe that as well. Um, and now, Going to uh, Federico's point, we also have product level information on production and sales. And we have both the value of said production and the quantity. So in theory, we could estimate prices. Um, so that's going to Federico's point about whether we observe prices. The caveat there though, is that an establishment is associated to an industry code based on its share of production across different types of products. And we only get the detailed product level information for those products that are part of the establishment's main production line. So for everything else, we just see an aggregate value. Um, so that's um, that's it. Okay. So then what we do is we um, we receive from Inegi after uh, long hours of work on their part uh, a crosswalk between firm IDs in Peme and establishment IDs in a meme. So that allows us to identify for every firm in PEME, what is the set of its establishments in a meme. And thus we can see, you know, total exports and we can see employment, product level information about production, even in those years when the firm doesn't export. And even in those years, either before it started exporting or after it stops exporting. So in that sense, we, ha we can have some information about the intensive margin um, as well. Okay, and then finally, well, we, we also need to know what the changes in tariffs were. Um, the 
uh, for this, we source this data from the Center of Agriculture and Rural Development from Iowa State University, which has um, HS10 digit tariff levels that were applied by the US. We aggregate those at the HS6 product code uh, by weighing each of the tariffs by the US share of imports um, in that um, product category at the HS8 level. And then beyond that, as, as I was kind of um, starting to mention in, in prior slides, we then weight those tariffs by um, how much Chinese uh, penetration there is into the US. And then at the firm level for Mexico, we weight those again by how exposed the firm is to the trade shock. So I'll, um, I'll show you how this is actually derived from a model in, in next. Well, um, how much time do I have? Do I have 20 minutes? You, you have until, until, yeah, you have 23 minutes. Okay. Then maybe, um, okay. So I just wanted to show you a few of the, the cool things that we can do with this data. So we can calculate for both uh, establishments that have an export that are part of an exporting firm and establishments that are not part of an exporting firm. So these are the establishments with exporting firms and establishment with non-exporting firms. We can calculate the share of their production associated to their main industry code and the share of production outside that main industry code. And this is um, what it looks like. So as you can see, exporting establishments actually have a larger share, are more likely to have a larger share of production outside the code that, it, that um, is associated with their main um, industry code. And meanwhile, establishments that not export tend to be single product, um, you know, single industry establishments. Although there is again some some variation in that. Um, oh, the other um, the other thing that we can do is like we can look at how um, these two different types of establishments, we will categorize by whether their parent firm exports or not, whether they hire outsourced labor or not. And as I was previewing earlier, it looks like establishments that are associated with an exporting parent firm tend to use higher shares of exporting, oh, sorry, of outsourced labor than do um, non-exporters. Again, this is a fact that, you know, I don't think, I don't know if it has been documented before, but we thought that it was an interesting thing to highlight. Um, and then, so related to the, the question of how many firms are there in, um, in each market. So again, this has some caveats because this doesn't count product destination markets where there's fewer than three firms participating. So taking the, and then I cannot tell you how many products that happens in. <laughs> But I can tell you that um, there, this is the number of uh, HS6 distinct products that were uh, traded between the US and Mexico in each year. So the number of traded products declined in 2007, went up in 2018. Um, and the mean number of firms competing in each destination um, product market was around 28, um, decreased slightly in 2017. Uh, to 27. Okay. Although, again, important um, to mention that this excludes product destination with less than three distinct firms, which can drive this average down potentially quite a bit. Okay, so let's um, let's talk about um, the model. Although I want to highlight the model is not really our main contribution, but it it is it is pretty neat that our shock is almost directly derived from a model where we just make a few strong assumptions. So let me just um, walk you through some of those um, assumptions and then we can talk about the results and how we bring this model to the data. So um, we start off by making the statement that tariffs that are applied um, against China by the US are gonna affect Mexico uh, through the price index, right? So Mexico wasn't directly involved in the trade war, so its effects, uh, if any, must be seen through prices. And we didn't demonstrate this using a CES model where we have firms, products, and different destinations. So we can express uh, firm's I revenue in product H. Produce, so firm I is going to be in country J, and it's going to sell to different countries. In this particular example, country L. Okay, so 
I denotes the firm, H denotes the product, J denotes the firm's I location, and L denotes uh, where they're exporting to. So the revenues uh, that come for, from product H for a firm that is located in country J uh, that is exporting to location or country L can be expressed as follows. So we have a demand shifter that just um, comes from the CDS price index. So AHL is just a demand shifter. And then P is the, the price that firm I um, charges for product H, receives for product H uh, located in country J, uh, exporting to destination L. Okay, so this, uh, the, what, we're, what we're gonna show is that the effect of um, the tariff to a firm in country uh, J, when the tariff is applied by country L to a country that isn't J, is gonna be um, through this change in A, so this demand um, shifter, right? So um, that's what we're trying to argue here. And how, how do we do that? Well, we'll do the following, right? So we have our demand shifter A, and we log differentiate that demand shifter, and we um, find the following equation, right? So there's some income effect that we're gonna ignore for now, but the effect on that demand shifter is just gonna be the weighted sum of the effect of uh, prices on all of the destinations uh, from which country L, who is the one that, that apply the tariff, in this case, the US, purchases product H across all of these different countries. Okay, right, so we have um, the weighted uh, price index here. I'm gonna show prices over here. Thank you, Benny. So if we use the properties of um, the CES function, we can substitute those, those weights, so the, the weights of the, each of the price um, for product H to different destinations, of the log price, sorry, of each of the weights for um, each of the country destination pairs, is, can be expressed as the share across all countries selling product H uh, to country L. Again, country is the one that is the US in this example, right? So we can express um, the log differentiation of the demand shifter as follows. So it's the product of an elasticity uh, and a weighted right, log price, changes in price across all of the destinations from which H purchases um, the good from. So again, and importantly, and this is uh, related to, I, I can't remember if it was maybe Ernesto who brought this up, but so one of the assumptions that we have to make here is assuming away general equilibrium and entry effects, we're gonna focus on the direct impact of uh, applying the tariff of country, we're now calling it country C because we're trying to associate it with China. Um, so if the, if the US applies a tariff to China um, in product H, then that change, uh, the log differentiated, um, the log change in the demand shifter is gonna be the product of an elasticity, the share of exports that the US L buys from China of product H times uh, the tariff. Okay. So then based on this assumption, we don't know exactly what the share of US consumption by product is. So this is something that the data doesn't show us. We will need to be able to see US consumption, not just from abroad, but also from national markets. So instead what we do is we decompose this share into two, into the product of two components. The import expenditure share of product H, so how much do you import of that product? How much do the US import from that product? And the share of import expenditures on products from the country that was hit by the tariff, country C, in uh, H. So this share right here, we can obtain directly from um, the import data from the US, from the US ITC data. And then the share of um, um, import expenditure here, we can also proxy for, as I will show you um, in a second. Oh, no, wait. No, that's not. Um, yeah, so. Um, hey, yeah, go ahead. So can I, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so this is Federico again. Um, so, so I guess there's nothing I mean, there's nothing in the data that restricts you to kind of do the same thing, uh, but 
uh, with Mexico relative to China, I guess, right? I mean, um, with Mexico. I guess probably the U.S. I guess probably the U.S. is more important for Mexico than China, but uh, but but like if you want to take like the full effect of the event then you might also want to sort of take into account the shock that Mexico received from the perspective of the trade with China. And and, I, I, and I'm not seeing anywhere where there will be a, any restriction that you wouldn't be able to do that, or maybe I'm missing something. So um, let me make sure that I understand that. So your point is that we could and potentially should incorporate the effect that so which tariffs are you thinking about here? Because the, the, the only reason so, why- So you have, you, you, you have two things going on, right? Like one is, is, is that China is gonna respond uh, directly to the tariff that uh, the US implemented and then also China retaliated, right? So tar China also implemented some tariffs and that's gonna affect the trade between China and Mexico uh, for those two reasons, right? So, so oh. I guess that's another shock that Mexico is gonna face at the same time from another trade partner uh -huh. Potentially, this this argument could hold for other other partners as well, but I guess China is sort of a first order thing that that it might be relevant to look at. Yeah, so I would say the my understanding is that the China retaliation tariffs were mostly concentrated in agricultural products, um, and here we're focusing on the manufacturing sector. So that's um, one thing. Uh, and yeah, yes. so in, in terms of the data, PME is by definition manufacturing only. Uh, so we can we we can see whether manufacturing firms are importing agricultural products and then um, try to still estimate the effect of the China tariff. But um, um, but yeah, so the first the first thing that I would say is that like that the retaliation tariffs are um, mostly in agriculture, and then. In terms of other potential effects, so the original equation here, it, in theory, incorporates all of the potential changes in the prices of product H for all destinations from where the U.S. Um, imports. But I guess what you have in mind is that, so what we're estimating here is just the demand shifter from the, the U.S. directly. And I think, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is we should take into account all of the possible destinations that, um, all of the possible demand shifters, like general equilibrium effects. Is that what you have in mind? I mean, you could do that, but uh, I was thinking something easier, which is sort of do the same thing, but instead of it, uh, saying that L is the US, you can say that it is China. I mean, the shock is going to be different, obviously, because of what we talked about, but, but, but you know, you could also get a demand shifter coming from China because of the response to the event, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not sure actually that this is going to be relevant for Mexico, given the trade. Um, um, that Mexico has with the U.S., but at least okay. for South America, I mean, the rest of South America, you know, China is a super important trade partner, so that will be something uh, that might be quantitatively relevant. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's, that's, that's a good point. We can, we can, we can try to do that. Um, I will. You're right that most of the trade from Mexico is towards the U.S. There is also an important element towards. Um, towards China though, so we can think about that. The only, so the China one, I, I think we can look into and, and, uh, and I agree with other countries. So when the effect is not due to a direct tariff, but rather by, you know, other generic climate effects, I would be less enthusiastic about <laughs> trying to, uh, to do that. But otherwise yeah. the, the China yeah. one, yeah, I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. All right, so then, uh, so now we have our measure for the, for the demand shifter, but this is only exploring the demand shifter for a particular product um, to a particular destination. And what we are after, at least for some of our specifications, uh, so when we look at the changes in a particular product to a particular destination, this is gonna be our measure, our model-based measure of the shock. We're gonna take the tariff, the average weighted tariff for the product H um, as applied to, by the US to China and weigh it by the share of imports of product H that the US obtains from China. So this is our model-based shock right here. When in specifications, when we're analyzing changes across products within a firm. But we also have we also have other specifications where what we're trying to analyze is instead for a firm that potentially exports many different products to potentially many different countries, what is a firm level shock? Right? 
So for that, I'm not going to walk you uh, again through the whole uh, derivation, but, so, but I hope that you will believe me when I say that we can express a firm's uh, product revenue uh, in product from, uh, sorry, revenue from product H, where the firm is located in country J, and exports to, this should say country, not county, uh, L, as a function of this demand shifter uh, and its inverse demand. Um, Right, so this is just an expression of how much revenue uh, a firm gets, and then we can aggregate that across all products and all of the destinations that firm I in country J sells to. So when we do that, and again, this also makes some assumptions about symmetry in elasticities and um, homogeneous cost functions for all firms within a particular firm product. So those are the assumptions that, that go in here. But, um, but otherwise, this is just you know, taking the sum of this revenue function, um, subtracting the cost for all products and all the destinations in a particular country. And you know, with some not too complicated math uh, that I'm, I hope you'll believe me, you, know, you take first order conditions, you aggregate across countries and destinations, and we find that we can show that the direct effects, so if the only thing that is happening is the direct effects of the US tariffs on China, then we can express the difference, the change in the revenues of uh, firm J as a product of some elasticities, the share of exports between country I and J, the export share of country U, which is the country that imposed the tariffs, the US, on uh, by product H and the model shock that we defined before. So the model shock, as we uh, mentioned before, this we can calculate using tariff data, the share of imports we can calculate directly from USITC data. The export share of any given product we can calculate with PEME data. Remember, we have information for um, how much of uh, the US exports come from a particular, um, so how much exports there are of each product to each destination. And then we also know from, uh, from uh, a means data how much of the revenues of firm I come from each particular, uh, either from local markets or from abroad. So this is in very broad terms, how we're gonna calculate our firm level exports. So again, when we're comparing across products, we're only gonna use this part of the shock. When we, when we want to look at firm outcomes, then we need to weigh that by the exposure that a firm has to the shock, which is the product of the exposure of the firm to the product itself, and then the exposure of the firm to international markets more broadly. Okay, and again, as Federico was pointing out, an important assumption here is that the direct effects are um, the U.S. tariffs on China only, and there's no no additional direct effects, like for example, the China tariffs on um, on back to the U.S. All right, so let's look at some um, results now. So I'm gonna show you at least two sets of results. The first one is about trade diversion. So we're gonna be using the model-based shock here where we don't have to wait by firm because we're comparing within firms. Okay, so the analysis here relies on the following specification. We're gonna have F denoting firms, H denoting products, and D denoting destinations. And in our main specification, we're gonna have the difference again between 2019 and 2017 of the inverse hyperbolic sign of the value of exports by firm F in product H and destination D. Remember, this is based on a balanced panel where we assign zeros even to destinations where the firm has never exported. So we use inverse hyperbolic sign instead of logs um, so that we can account for any extensive margin uh, variation as well. Uh, and then over here, we have the tariff shock. We assume that the tariff shock only applies to products in the US. We have a different specification where we say, well, what if the tariff shock has some other effects on other markets and not just the US, like there you have in mind, although um, the tariff shock as we derived it should apply only to the US, right? And here we have firm fixed effects and HS6 product level fixed effects. So because this is a single different approach, the fixed effects here are not firm fixed effect, but rather firm growth and product growth fixed effects, right? And we consider a single difference between 2019 and 2017 and a double difference 
between 2019 and 17 versus 17 and 15. Okay, so I think I explain all that. So um, this is a result uh, for single difference and double differences where we're using as a trade shock the non-model version. So over here, we're just taking the weighted average of tariff shock. So if we didn't have the model and we just said, well, we believe that the shock to a product is just the weighted average of uh, the products um, from with, within each HS8 category. So here we find um, in our preferred specification that has the HS6 fixed effect. So every, every column is adding more uh, fixed effects. So here we have no uh, product fixed effects, two digit, four digit, and six digit fixed effects. So we're here we find an effect of 0.36% in the single difference um, specification and 0.99% in the double difference specification. So this is the, the non-model version, but let me show you the model one. So this is the, the one where we've already, now we've, we've weighted our tariff shocks by how, um, by the share of imports from the US that come from China of that particular product. So in that sense, what this does is that if there were a certain product where the US imposed a very high tariff, but imports very little from China to begin with from that product, then that would make the shock smaller. And alternatively, if that uh, the tariff, if a tariff was applied to a product where uh, the US imports a lot from China, then we would see a much larger average um, value for the shock. Right? So that's the difference between this specification and the one that I showed you before. And what we find here is effects that are almost three times as large. So that means that the tariff shocks tended to be applied to products that high a high import share from the US. Um, okay, so yeah, so what um, using the model-based approach, we find an effect, so we find that growth rates increase at the firm level by 1.2% in a single different specification and up to 3.3% in a double different specification. Um, so again, as we, we take this to mean that within firms, uh, firms seem to be reallocating their uh, exports towards products that were affected by the, um, the China tariff. So now we also look at new entries. And again, here we define a new entry as, it is an, a linear probability model where we have as a dependent variable, a variable that is equal to one, if in period T, firm F exported product H to destination T for the first time. So this is the first time that we observe this particular firm exporting this particular product uh, to this particular country. Um, so we see how this probability varies with the tariff shock. And again, we have firm and then also product time fixed effects here. So we're controlling for any, so this is uh, within the firm, um, controlling for product uh, time trends. How, how does this probability um, change? So when we use the, the model uh, version, we find a decline um, in uh, entry to the US in particular of, um, this is 46 percentage points, but this would be for a, a one log uh, increase in the tariff and the mean increase in the tariff was um, point, point 0.1 log points. So the way to interpret this coefficient here is that the mean tariff decreased the probability of a new product entry to the US by 4.7 uh, percentage points. Now, the average probability of entry at any given point in time is around 13%. So this represents about a 50% uh, decline in the probability of entry to that particular product market that was affected by the tariff shocks in the US. The probability of entering to any market also declines, but by a much smaller share. Brenda? Yeah. Uh, uh... The fact that the, for all destinations it's smaller than only for the US, uh -huh. shall we interpret it how? It's, it's just the US is part of all the trade uh, that Mexico does, and that's it? Or is there some, some uh, increase in, in 
new entry to other destinations that is that are not the US. Yeah. So that's a good question. And I think that's something that we can look into. So so I, because I think one possibility maybe... is just mechanical. It's it's just the US is part of all the exports, therefore it's just accounts by uh, 0 0.096, and when you look only in the US, it's 0.468. But also there could yeah. be some economics there. Yeah, so that, that that's a good question. Out of the top of my head, I don't think I have a great answer, but let me let me try to give a full one out of a hat nonetheless. So something that we could potentially uh, do to try to get a sense of what, what's happening there is comparing the weighted versus the model version. And maybe that might give us some highlights, if not directly to your question, to something that could be potentially tangentially related. So if we compare the weighted um, version of the tariff shock. So the weighted version of the tariff shock is just telling us um, how does uh, entry respond to um, a tariff that is just um, that is that, that, that the direct tariff basically to the product, right? So th this tariff has product, regardless of how important imports from the US, um, imports from China to the US are in that product. Uh, and in that case, it, it is positive. So this is saying products um, across all destinations, products that were hit by a tariff shock, Mexico seems to enter more um, towards. Once you take into account how much the U.S. spends in that product from China, then that seems to decline. So, um, what, if anything, can we learn from these two? And again, this is to every every country. So, if the results were just driven by what you were saying, like, oh well, the Mexico and the U.S. they just have the biggest. Um, yeah, so it, the, the U.S. is just the biggest market and hence all destinations, because it includes the U.S., this is just like saying the U.S. decline. But I feel like the fact that there's the, the weighted version versus the model version, this one is positive and this one is negative, that might give us some indication about whether this is just related to just the size of the U.S. market versus not. Again, it's not an ideal answer, but, it, but in trying to provide an answer, I think maybe we should say something like that. Uh, but we we can... We can look further into that. Like among other things, we can you know split this further and just say, what about you know exports to non-US uh, rather than all destinations? Yeah. May I add something, Daniela? Yes. Here, yeah. I also think that there is it is important to remember that uh, Donald Trump applied huge tariffs to China and kept threatening throughout all this period Mexico to apply similar tariffs, especially if Mexico wasn't controlling Im immigration. So I think um, that for the case of Mexico, the threat of seeing a similarly high tariff was um, much more real than just, oh, maybe this can happen. And, and I think this relates to the uncertainty that Brenda was mentioning before and the question that Miguel asked, um, if other things were happening, uh, like other costs related to tariffs, not necessarily, probably just the fact that for Mexico, the, the threat was very real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then one, one last thing is we, we do have destination product fixed effects in here. So at the very least, it's demeaned by the size of the market in that sense. But, but yes, yes I, we, could, we could potentially look more into like if. So if I let me just make sure that I understand your question correctly, right? Is is this negative because just because this one is negative and this one is very important, right? So so yeah, I th I think the answer is not exclusively, but but we can look further into that. Yeah. Okay. Brenda. Um, um, yeah. There are five minutes. Uh, maybe okay. a couple more since we started later. Uh, so just keep it in mind. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so we're 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 almost uh, there. So now. Um, we've talked about trade diversion. Where we conclude so far is well, there is significant trade diversion, even at the firm level. The magnitudes are high, and it seems to be concentrated in the intensive margin because we find this uh, reduction in the probability, the important reduction in the probability of entering a new product market, uh, especially the product markets that were affected by the tariff shocks. So, uh, how do these firms, how do these firms that are now exporting more to the U.S., how are they handling that increase in demand? Uh, so that's what we're going to look into first. 
So we have, again, firms denoted as F, products denoted as H, destinations as D, and then time periods as P. We're going to focus in this case in um, quarterly, year-on-year uh, -year quarter changes. So we're going to focus on the first quarter of each year exclusively. Um, and we, in the period between 2015, and actually for these specifications, we drop um, 2020, even though um, the U.S. hadn't quite yet uh, entered the pandemic, the very end of March um, had, so we, we, we want to avoid, at least for now, um, including those effects. So in reality, we should say 2019. Um, so our main specification is going to be now the natural log, because we no longer have all, all these zeros. We are able to observe the firm, whether it exports or not, thanks to a means data. So what we're going to have is in our main specification, the natural log of different outcomes for the firm, employment, wages, production, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have our tariff. we now note that the tariff shock here is denoted not just by the product, but also by the firm. So each firm gets its own shock. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how that, that is defined. We have firm fixed effects and then time fixed effects here as well. Okay, so we're no longer can we exploit directly the um, product um, type fixed effect because now we have aggregated the shock to the firm level. So our firm level shock is the product of the tariff as defined by either the model, or we also look at the average one, but our preferred specification is using the model, multiplied by the firm's exposure to the shock. And this exposure, uh, we measure in a way that tries to proxy what the model tells us the exposure should be, which is how exposed the firm is to a particular product. So this is just, we have the tariff shock at the product level here, and we weigh it by how much of the firm's exports to the US, um, how much does that product account for the total value of exports of that firm? We focus here on the US only. I guess one modification that we could do is we could expand this to other countries if we are assuming that there are other direct effects, like Federico was suggesting, for now we don't do that. We only have the US. Uh, export um, share. And then we um, additionally weight that by how important are the international markets for that firm's revenue. Right? So you can imagine that a firm has a similar product composition. So you can imagine two firms that have similar product composition of exports, but then one of them is very important in the local market. So even though they have similar exposure to the product, um, their, their relative importance for the firm as a whole differs depending on their participation in the local market as well. So um, this weight accounts for that. All right. Okay. So Miranda, uh, mm -hmm. you have the outcome at the firm FHDT level. Do you see employment, for example, at that level of this aggregation? So, I mean, what, what, what outcomes do you see at that level? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a fair point. So no, at the firm, we have um, most of the outcomes F of T really. We could potentially, um, so at the firm, we'd see different establishments um, in, in each okay. firm. So, and potentially, you know, different establishments have different industry codes and they also have different okay. locations. So potentially we could do something to that, but yeah, so this, this, is, this is just indexing wise, this should be just, uh, um, this should be just F, um, FT, right? Uh, although to calculate that uh, the tariff, we do use uh, variation in the firm across age. So the outcome, no, the tau, yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. We also consider different measures of exposure to international shocks, things like what is the, uh, the value of your exports relative to the value of your total production. Um, but but we're more, we feel more comfortable with this specification, mainly because it's measured in the same units. Um, okay, so what do we find? I want to focus on the model um, version uh, rather than the weighted uh, version, because as you know, this one is derived directly from a model and we can make a uh, good sense of it. So we find that the total number of employees increases. And again, importantly, this is controlling for both time fixed effects and firm fixed effects. Okay. So firms, um, the, and this, we can interpret this directly as an elasticity. This is, there is a 1.1% increase in total employees. And this is driven by an increase in blue collar workers. So there's an increase of a 0.97%, 96% increase in blue collar workers. 
the effect on white collar workers is not statistically uh, significant. In number of hours, we also see an increase, 1.2% uh, increase in hours. And this is again driven by an increase on directly hired blue collar workers. I didn't add all of the uh, results here, but again, we have a lot of, a lot of outcomes. And um, this is the one that I wanted to, to highlight. Another important uh, factor is that we do not find a statistically significant increase in social security payments. So it, the, the, the value is positive, but not statistically significant. Uh, in parentheses, we have that these statistics. Um, so it's not necessarily close to being statistically significant. Um, but the reason why I want to highlight that is because if firms are accurately reporting the social security payments, then this is an indication that the workers that are being hired are not being formalized. So these are workers that are being hired without enrollment in social security which would be consistent with an expansion of the informal sector. Now we'll try to do more to analyze whether that's the case using the worker level data, but for now, this is to some extent indicative of um, informality potentially rising. Mm. Okay, this is um, how much firms pay for outsourced employment. There seems to be a decline, although again, not statistically significant by any, by any means. Okay. So, so, think, so on wages, yeah. do you do you know? Can you can you separate la, like like wages of new hires relative to wages of stayers? No, or, not with or, this or data. Just firm now. No, okay. with this data, with this data, we only know the firm total payroll, and it's just oh, okay. divided between you know um, the, these different types of workers. But with um, with the worker data, we hope to be able to see well is this worker someone that was recently hired or not? We can control for tenure, and potentially we could even see direct transitions. Again, because we haven't actually done this, I can make grandiose promises and tell you that we'll be able to see transitions and, you know, <laughs> new hires, old hires, tenure, anything. Uh, but we, we, I, I have high hopes for the data, we'll see. Uh, I'm always naive, naively hopeful of all data that I haven't seen yet. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, revenue and sales, with the model-based um, um, shock, we don't find statistically significant effects. Um, with the weighted one, we do find an effect on production and on sales. And, and interestingly, uh, importantly, I would argue, in neither one of uh, the tariff-based shocks do we find an effect on production or sales outside the firm's own industry code. So what I mean by this is, as I mentioned earlier, a firm, a firm can have many establishments. Exporting firms in particular tend to be multi-establishment firms. And at the establishment level, we observe their product level um, production. Uh, and we can see whether that production is in a product that is directly um, under the main industry um, of the firm or, or not. So uh, in this sense, that tariff shock, because the tariff shock is created at the product level, we're kind of assuming that it is most likely to impact at least positively impact production in the next code that is the main um, line of production for the establishment. Consistent with that, at least in the weighted version of the shock, we find an increase in total production and total sales, but no statistically significant effect in production or sales of product outside that main industry code. So there doesn't seem to be necessarily a reallocation away from producing other things. Uh, within the establishment, but rather just an increase in total production of um, the products that were affected by the tariff shock. It's puzzling. It's puzzling that that, that sales and production don't go up. In the model given that employment, yeah, given that employment was going up strongly. That's true. So something to point out between the weighted version and the model version of the shock is that. Uh, when we looked at trade diversion, the model version had higher magnitude of shocks. That is also true in this uh, analysis. The difference, though, is that the standard errors are a lot larger in the model version of the shock. So in terms of magnitude, so if we care, if we care about economic magnitude, it is actually larger for all variables in the model. The only difference is that we have more noise in the model version of the shock. So okay. that's because I guess, I guess I guess it's 
Yeah, I guess since you're using this kind of shift share type of design for the model, maybe you could sort of correct the standard errors using these sort of mm. latest research that, that sort of show that these standard errors are not so easy to, to estimate. Maybe that could help you. Maybe it's going to go in the opposite direction. I'm not sure, but but that's something available out there. Yeah, that that um, it. I think it might increase the errors, but yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, no. Yes. no, but you're right. We 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 definitely. I mean, we we should be calculating the rest and the errors. We're not doing it right now, but yeah. So in terms of, um, why is it the case that it's not statistically significant, especially when we do find an effect on employment? The answer is that it's 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 mainly the the standard errors, not the magnitude of the coefficient. The magnitude of the coefficient, as with all of the other specifications, becomes higher. Um. Well, I guess outside of NICS, it's, it's, um, it's an exception to that. But uh, for all of the other dependent variables, uh, the model has larger larger effects on the weighted one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Um, the US-China war did divert trade towards Mexico. The import for Mexico for products affected by the tariff shock had an aggregate. I didn't actually show you this, but this is just come from total uh, aggregate. So um, at the aggregate level, Imports from Mexico for products affected by the tariff uh, increased with a 3% elasticity. We find the elasticities at the firm level, and we find that they are uh, large, statistically significant, and this is true even after controlling for firm and product growth trends. New entry to the um, U.S. decline for those products affected by the tariff. Um, this is an outdated number, so the probability decreased, as you know, by 4.7 percentage points. For the mean increase in tariffs, which is equal to uh, a 10% um, increase, 10 percentage points increase, sorry. Um, and we also find that a 1% um, increase in the exposure of a firm to the tariff increased blue collar direct higher employment and wages. It also increased total production and sales with the non model based tariff. And it has no statistically significant effect on white collar employment, outsourced employment, or production in a secondary industry, or revenue from the national market. So, all in all, we find that firms are uh, producing more. Um, they are exporting more to the US. There doesn't seem to be a reallocation of production between the local and the foreign market. And there does seem to be an increase in labor demand, particularly for blue collar direct higher employees that are potentially being hired outside of the formal sector. So with this um, last set of results, we believe are um, important, you know, motivating factors to explore what happens to the non-exporting firms, right? Since the effect seems to be, they're not moving production outside of the local market, um, but rather they're demanding more labor. We we think that the mechanism through which non-exporting firms could potentially be affected would be the labor market. So we'll we'll, we'll explore that, and we're happy to get you know questions of other things about that that you think would be interesting to explore and how to uh, do this. We have an idea of how to do the non-exporting aspects, but um, unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you about it. Um, but again, thank you so much for your comments and the opportunity and. Um, Happy to talk some more about any and all of this. Thank you so much, Brenda. Uh, um, it was a great presentation.